Thank you. I was very pleased to be asked to speak here. I'm a barrister in Bristol. I've just put the text of my talk up on my website, pinned it to my Twitter feed. All the cases, all the blogs I talk about are linked there. So please read them. If you don't like my take, you don't agree with it, then that's fantastic. Challenge it. But people have to know what's going on, because I'm afraid it looks like we've lost the judges. And this is really, really terrifying. So why, why am I here? Why am I interested in this? Oh, sorry. So why, why am I here and why am I interested in this? Well, first of all, obviously, I'm a woman. Um, secondly, I'm a disabled woman. So the delusion of self-ID as a cure for my unhappiness is shown to me and every disabled person every single day. We cannot identify out of ourselves. Because every day, the people around us, the hostile environments that we have to navigate, tell us what our reality is. To claim another's identity is a choice for the privileged. A black woman cannot claim to be white, but Rachel Dolzo can claim to be black and bear a Nigerian name. I'm also a lawyer. I've worked in child protection now for 20 years, and I've been campaigning since 2014. With greater openness and honesty in our debate about the family justice system. So it seems that all my experiences, personal and professional, have brought me to this moment. And there is so much to worry about, about the erasure of biological sex as an identifying characteristic. I could be here all night. So I've decided to focus on the one thing that causes me the most concern, the protection of our children. Because my central hypothesis is this, people would rather feel, would rather cause pain than feel it. That is why we are in this mess, I think. There is a lack of mature discussion in our society about these issues of really grave and serious importance. And I'm quite sure social media is largely behind it, the push to tribalism, which I think has been spoken about so eloquently um, by Joe. What I see, though, really worryingly, is the law being used as a weapon, not to promote rights, but to silence people, to stop them exercising their own. I can see the efforts of some groups and individuals to push back against this. I'm thinking of Fair Cop, Maya Forstarter, to name but a few. But the fact that we even have such individuals and groups begging for money on crowd justice sites is a real nasty indication of just how strange things have become. People are sacked for expressing wrong think. The police are being used to enforce people's feelings against other people's Article 10 rights of freedom of expression. Woo! We are in dangerous <laughs> In this scenario, where a legal system is used to prioritise the rights of one minority against another, it's not the women, it's the children. It's always the children, because they only have the voice that the adults around them give them. So what supports my hypothesis? What happened recently that's got me so worried? Well, there are two things, out of the very many, I'd like to bring to your attention tonight. We've got decisions in the High Court of England and Wales only three years apart about transitioning preschoolers. We then have the NSPCC debacle and the subsequent intervention in my Twitter discussions of the pro paedophile group Prostasia. So let's start with the shifting position of the High Court. I don't know if any of you remember, back in 2016 there was the case of Reed J involving a four-year-old. His mother claimed he disdained his penis and wished to be a girl. She was supported throughout by mermaids who came to court with her. 
When the judge um, did not agree with the mother and ordered that the child live with his father, where he quite happily developed an interest in Power Rangers and SpongeBob, mermaids <laughs> issued an angry press release and said they would appeal. They did not. You can find links to the case and the commentary about it uh, on the website, as I've said. So, so far, so good. I thought if we could rely on anybody to demonstrate some common sense, it would be a High Court judge. But only three years later came the case of the Lancashire County Council and TP and others, permission to withdraw care proceedings. This case involved foster carers who had two unrelated children in their care who wanted to transition. The first child was R, who decided that he wanted to transition age seven. That was their biological child. The second child was H, who was no relation to them, whose path along transition was started at the age of four years and against the advice of that child's school. And I appreciate this case was about withdrawing care proceedings, so it's a different situation from BJ. But even so, it's really interesting to see how the judge framed the issue of transitioning preschoolers. He said, Notwithstanding even the guardian's caution in respect to the openness of the foster carers, to the possibility of alteration in the children's attitude to their gender identity, I conclude that Dr. Matursky's evidence demonstrates that it is obvious that neither of these grounds would meet the threshold. Taken together with the panoramic evidence of the child-focused approach of the foster carers, and this is the bit I have in gold, it is overwhelmingly obvious that neither H nor R have suffered or are at risk of suffering significant emotional harm arising from their complete social transition into females occurring at a very young age. The evidence demonstrates to the contrary that this was likely to minimize any harm or risk of harm. The evidence does not support the contention that it was actively encouraged rather than appropriately supported. How on earth, and this is, if there's only one question that, that fits in your brain after tonight, I would really hope it's this. How on earth is it overwhelmingly obvious that a four-year-old boy will experience no harm from a, transit, from a decision to transition from male to female? I've got an enormous amount of difficulty with this judicial unquestioning acceptance of the evidence of Dr. Pestersky in this case. It's not just because I find it extremely hard to accept that any four-year-old has the language or the developmental capacity to communicate a desire to change sex, but I also know how Dr. Pestersky approached this in another case that wasn't before the High Court judge in this one. Jay and the Secretary of State for Justice in 2018 is, is worth a read if you haven't already. Um, Ms. Jay was a man in his 40s who wanted to become a woman. Um, he was slightly hampered in this aim because he was serving an eight-year prison sentence for handling explosives with intent to endanger life. And there's rather a chilling aside from one of the professors in that case that they ought to be considering a move of Ms. Jay to a female prison. Dr. Petersky opined in this case without any reservations that what Miss J had was genuine gender dysphoria. And she was certainly enthusiastic. I think she tried to remove one of her own testicles in her prison cell. With, with what implement, I don't know, but one can't doubt the enthusiasm. But Dr. Barrett um, reported rather earlier than Dr. Petersky and struck a much more cautious note. And this is one of the elephants in the room. This is what I don't think we've got to grips with or we're talking about. The extent to which gender dysphoria masks other mental illnesses or sexual obsessions and fetishes. Dr. Barrett said he doubted that Miss J really was gender dysphoric because some of her reported history was directly at odds with documentary records. In other words, she was a liar. He said, <laughs> if the lateral corroboration is not convincingly elicited, 
I would have grave doubts and I would wonder whether Miss J's somewhat dependent personality had caused her to unwisely latch on to a change of gender role as a seemingly universal solution to both why her life had gone wrong and how it might be rectified. I think it's worth contemplating with considerable unease just what would have happened to that four-year-old boy in VJ if that case was being heard and decided this week. Would the High Court judge have been able to protect that little boy from the mother who was telling everybody he disdained his penis? Or would that child have been sacrificed to what to me seems like a compulsive drive to be simply seen as woke and inclusive? This really worries me when I turn to the next example, the NSPCC and the interaction I then have with the organisation Prostasia. I'm sure you're all familiar with the NSPCC's public response to people who raised concerns about one of their employees allegedly masturbating at work, filming it and publishing the video online. I'm really pleased, even though it's belatedly, the NSPCC had the sense to realise that publicly telling people who raised concerns that they were bigots and should be reported was not the right thing to do. They have referred themselves, they tell me, to the Charity Commission, and I will await with interest the outcome of that. <laughs> but it's what happened to me afterwards on Twitter that chilled me to the bone. I was discussing with various people after this scandal broke that we should consider stopping making any further charitable donations to the NSPCC, considering smaller local charities where we could have more confidence in their governance. An organisation called Prostasia popped up on my field, on my Twitter feed, sorry, and suggested they might be a worthwhile beneficiary of the English people's money. This was odd, as a quick Google showed them to be based in California and advocating sex positive child protection, whatever that means. What I suspect it means is support for men who want to have sex with children. This suspicion was confirmed when another Twitter user found a copy of a mugshot of a man who was active in our Twitter conversation and, at the time, not anymore, was on the Prostasia website. That mugshot stated this man had been arrested in 2012 for sexual conduct with a child under 13. Prostasia then blocked us all and a couple of days later tried to blackmail me, which is a whole other story I don't have time for now. But it's a very clear indication of the murky waters in which these organisations swim and the lengths to which they will go to shut you up. So what does all this come together to show you? I'm afraid it's this, the inability or unwillingness of both pro-trans activists and pro-pedophile groups to distinguish teenagers and preschoolers. Because what Prostasia had in common with the views of the legal advisor for mermaids is a persistent refusal to identify what they meant by a child. Why does this matter? Well, it matters in this way. The legal definition of a child is a person aged 0 to 18. The majority of children under 12 are unlikely to be considered gig competent to make important decisions about their own lives. I appreciate we have a difficult and grey area when we get to children, say, between 13 and 16. I quite accept there may be many 13-year-olds who, as individuals, have greater capacity to make choices than the law allows them. But we have to draw the line somewhere. We can't run safeguarding on a case-by-case -case basis. We have to protect children. And the criminal law draws the line really clearly for us. Check out the Sexual Offences Act of 2003. A child under 13 cannot consent to sex. It is rape. They do not have the capacity. I therefore consider myself on very firm ground when I say, as I do, that the vast majority of children under 12 
neither want nor need exposure to adult sexuality. It's really important that they're allowed the time and space to develop their own identities and their own sexual preferences, free of coercion and manipulation from adults. And once they cross that threshold into having capacity, they should be free to live and love as they wish, according to the boundaries of existing laws. Sexual activities between fully consenting people is none of my business or concern. But what I'm seeing over the last year or so has caused me increasing concern about the extent to which some men wish to reframe the discussion about the sexuality of children. This is very clear to me because of the extent to which they are often coy about stating how they define a child. But the difference between, for example, a typical nine-year-old and a typical 16-year-old is vast and in every domain, physical, social and sexual. In March of this year, someone alerted me to a blog post by the Mermaid's Legal Advisor. That person was arguing this. Someone's gender identity at any age must be respected. A child identifying as trans, whether it has been submitted this is a result of harm or not, is identifying as trans and that must be respected throughout proceedings. More often than not, if a child says they are trans, they will be trans. I commented at the time, any such assertion made without attempting even the barest analysis of the vast gulf in understanding and capacity between a six-year-old and a 16-year-old is an assertion of no value. Worse than that, it is an assertion which attempts to pave the way to leave young children entirely unprotected. Most parents love their children and want to do what is in their best interests. A small minority of parents fail to do that. The courts absolutely must be ready, willing and able to step in and protect these children. Mm -hmm. Anyone who is unwilling or unable to see the difference between a child of six and a child of sixteen is someone who wishes to blur the boundaries around child protection and safeguarding. Why would anyone want to do that? I can only assume that the only answer I can find is to make it easier to secure the eradication of the rights of children to be protected from the imposition of men's sexual will. And what is worse, their rights are going to be eradicated at the same time that we are told that we are the villains and the bigots. And that's an elephant in the room for me when it comes to feminism. The people commented on pictures of hypersexualized children at various pride marches, one I think estimated to be about eight years old in full makeup and high heels, his mother walking behind him, holding the ribbons of his angel wings. Now a lot of people commenting favour on that were women, who will call themselves feminists, who will raise their hands high for this wonderful, inclusive illustration of a sex-positive society. That child was seven, and there should have been care proceedings instituted in the very yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. dangerous or unsatisfying about being closer to the truth. Let's have a proper discussion. Not everyone who wants to transition does so out of a realisation of their essential self, a self that apparently nobody, not even themselves, can define. Some will do it because they are predators. Predators predate. That is what they do. If you want a horrible and recent example, look at the recently convicted paedophile Carl Beach, who volunteered at the NSPCC between 2012 and 2015, and they sent him into primary schools. The wolf is no longer at the door. The wolf is in your kitchen. He's saying he's got a legal right to be there, and he's demanding that you make him breakfast. I'm now too old and too fed up to do anything other than speak up. This will not be done in my name. 
And I hope it's not going to be done in the names of anybody in this room. 